founder of Presbyterian. I felt like Hayes and Grant doesn't really talk about Jesus too much. <laughs> um, he's a, he's, he seems promising from the liberal standpoint. He, he, he tries for a lower tariff, lower tax in his career in living, which is going to be good. You know, if I'm a if I'm a poor German worker in New York and I like Hamburg hats that are made in Germany, if the tax barrier goes down, hats can flood into the country because there's not such a tax on them and I can buy it. It'll be nice for this cold weather or hat you know, I can wear it. Um, so it helped the poor people to have a lower tariff. And he also gets through the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, which regulates railroads for the first time. That's what liberals like, regulate business Give government a little bit more you know, into things. Liberals believe we can have a better future, primarily through the use of government. Whereas conservatives say, hey, look how great it was back then when we bring back some of that in the good old times. Before we had to go, that's pretty much the basic of the line. So liberals sometimes are excited because he created the Interstate Commerce Commission, which helped to regulate railroads. Of course, railroads will be regulated out of business in the 20th century. But um, Grover seems kind of nice. Um, like many other Democratic politicians, too, he had a little problem with his sexual resume. Um, when he was a lawyer, he, he had some women on his side. Um, um, one of the popular chants of the election of 1884, when Grover was elected as the first Democrat we've had since 1856 in Franklin Purse, um, one of the chants was, well, I'm sorry, not Franklin Purse, uh, it was James Buchanan in um, One of the chants we have is, Mom, Mom, where's my pop? Going to the White House, ha, ha, ha. Because he had had a little bit of a child. Um, and, um, but he did provide child support uh, to this Maria Helpman who had his child. I uh, also, kind of like Bill Clinton, you know, John Kennedy and Lyndon Judson and Franklin Roosevelt, who had their issues, uh, he had this really good friend, uh, a widow, Disposal. He was providing, he was becoming a ward of her daughter, Fanny. He was a very good looker, and he was like 17 years old. And Miss Folsom uh, thought that you know, Grover was interested in her, and that you know, the two would, would get married. Um, but what happened was, is when <coughs> her daughter, Frances, reached 18, Grover married her. And as he married his ward, um, kind of upset the but, and also, he's, he's, he's thought to maybe obstruct Francis, too. So it must have really been in the hierarchy time. Although they did have a baby, baby Ruth. And that's where you get the candy bar from. This baby was born in the White House. It was very famous. So it isn't the ball player of baby Ruth. Baby Ruth. It's baby Ruth. Because if they had a daughter named Ruth, Francis and Grover. So <laughs> Grover had this issue. Like that. But, but in any case, he seems kind of promising. And yet, he's not really a classic liberal in the sense that he's showing a lot of concern for the average people out of work. What he's trying to do is be more fair. And he's quite a difference. For example, one thing Grover Cleveland did every day was he would go out in his carriage ride in the afternoon. He was a very hard worker. Um, one time, you know, he worked so hard, and then quit until 11 o'clock at night, and that one time his wife woke him up and he said, I think this burglars in the house. Uh, this while he was present, he put a and said, uh, well, um, there may be burglars in the Senate, but there's not burglars in the house. <laughs> no tell. But anyway, um, so he worked hard, but he, he took a carriage ride every afternoon, and uh, he was uh, went out to his carriage ride, and uh, there was this man that was trying to dramatize how poor he was by eating grass. You know, we need government to help us just looking at use eating grass. And we have this class warfare and socialism and anarchism. So he's eating grass like this. Right in front of, right in Cleveland's face. And Cleveland was said to stop and said, You know, the grass is even taller on the other side of the executive mansion if you want to eat it there. Not a lot of sympathy. Grover Cleveland actually, actually one time said, The word is the duty of the people to serve the government. It is not the duty of the government to serve the people. Imagine trying to get away with that today. 
But Grover the Good did do something good. He lowered the tariffs, which were getting very high, which did help the poor. Ironically, well, again, there's this political Harry Carey thing going on that we see with Garfield and Hayes and Arthur. Because what his opponent will do then in the next election, Benjamin Harrison, is go to all the rich people who are being wrecked by this low tariff, and maybe they sell hands. Now they're not doing so well because all these cheap European imports are flooding in because there's no tariff pay. So Benjamin Harrison goes up to the head dealer and says basically, hey, why don't you give some money to my election so I win? This is when money replaces patronage. When the big spenders, the billionaires, now have the advantage over the charismatic people that can say, hey, Mama, I'm going to give you a job if you like so this is a, a consequence of the Pendleton Act. Grover does take it on the chain. But again, it was for the good of the system at the time. He needed more taxes at the time. Because Benjamin Harrison, who's another Civil War gentleman, uh, a Republican from Ohio, uh, takes office, we immediately begin to suspect this guy. He's brazen enough as a Presbyterian who will appoint all Presbyterians to his cabinet. Anyone ever done that? No. He wore chemise skin because he didn't want to be infected by anyone else's germs. He was a great legal mind. People from Harvard and Yale hate him because he never went to those places. He only went to Miami College in Ohio, but he was noted as the greatest legal mind of the country. He gave great speeches. He actually moved to Indianapolis after being born in Ohio and the rest of them. He was a great legal mind, but it was said that shaking his hand was like shaking a wilted platoon. The talking to him was like talking to a hitching post. He had a surly, disagreeable, ordinary type personality. And yet, and yet, despite all these negatives, Hedrick and Harrison lives up to the billing of the forgettable presidents, but only I think something good. And maybe for that reason, not being memorable. Um, he showed a real independence of spirit. You know, we say he didn't really get along with people, he had a lot of friends, except for his wife. He was, he was a pious midnight dude with his wife, Carolyn. They, they were very close, um, but not with people. But that independence allowed him to step aside from the very millionaires who were elected him. And it is this guy who's so independent that signs, for instance, the Sherman Antitrust Bill. Uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act is a law against the great monopolies called trusts. Does anyone know the difference between a trust and a monopoly? So monopolies own all the companies in the related business, say the steel business. Whereas a trust is a company that owns all the stock in the related business. So a trust was just a way of evading monopoly laws. It was a de facto, an in fact monopoly, the trust. And the, the rich people were using trust to get around anti-monopoly legislation. Uh, but, but the guy who was elected by the rich goes after the rich in the Sherman Antitrust Act. Many people needed money in this. We actually used gold and silver coins. That's how we got paid. But there was enough money to go along, around. And yet it was this guy who was elected from the party of the rich who signed the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, where the government purchased 4.5 million ounces of silver every month to pump into the money supply. Now, a lot of people in the Republican Party say, wait a minute, you know, I lent off money in gold, and now they're paying me back in silver? That's not right. But Harrison, as the independence, you know, it's great to know that, you know, it's time we made this adjustment. What's kind of also kind of, a, I think, a nice corrective to present-day presidents is when Benjamin Harrison was president, we were actually rolling in clover. A short list of priorities. We didn't spend that much for that reason. The government actually had more money than it knew what to do with. And so one thing he does is he gives out $135 million to veterans, which is a nice group of life that people have sacrificed their life for the country. And he reduced the price of postage stamps from three cents to two cents. When does that ever happen? In fact, this is the last time our government has actually sold it. 
You know, today we all have to pay $60,000 oh, you know, to all 300 million of us. $60,000 a piece? We still wouldn't be out of debt. Chinese and money is a lot of money. Right. Well, we'll get into that whether I just know problematic it is. So we can kind of, uh, you know, respect Benjamin Harrison, I think, for this uh, reason. And indeed, we can go from this whole s situation and say, uh, you know, that the forgettable presidents maybe were good precisely because they were memorable, because they became forgettable, because they didn't get us involved in another war. They didn't reopen the wars of the Civil War. They didn't have any you know, expensive overseas engagement. They had a short list of priorities. They dealt with the class issue. They dealt with the corruption issue. And then finally, they're an important corrective to a lot of presidential egotism and overstretch today. And I'm going I'm to be a little mean and satirical here, uh, so I hope I don't go over the top, but I'm just going to kind of uh, try to impersonate some of our more recent leaders. And um, I don't know if you agree with these impersonations, but uh, I'm Bill Clinton. Uh, when Hillary and I are elected, we're going to make sure that every child in America, regardless of race, creed, or sexual preference, is going to be entitled to good quality health care. And I don't mean substandard care where you get a staph infection or rabies from getting a measles, measles vaccination, but good federal care, like the kind you get from the post office or the IRS. And we're going to make sure that by the year 2000, every child in America is going to be hooked up to high-speed internet. <laughs> and of course, I don't mean by that, that they're going to be hooked up to uh, smutty crude sites, kind of like the Star Report. Because, you know, as my wife Hillary says, it takes a village. And we don't want our young girls growing up with, you know, looking at sites with crude and disgusting uh, stories about the male, <laughs> the male imagination. <laughs> I am Al Gore. Democratic candidate in 2000. We Democrats care about working class families. Our Republican opponents, <laughs> they think they'll let working class families starve. Now, we have here in the audience today one Venus Willendorf, whose HMO won't give her the palate expander she wants for a silver smile, who won't get the liposuction because of her HMO. And under our Democratic plan, which includes a criminal's bill of rights, and a patient's bill of rights, and a teacher's bill of rights, we're going to make sure that G2 can look like Oprah on winter. I'm George Bush, governor of Texas. And I'm governor of Texas so people will fall down cliffs and they'll be hit by Volkswagens. And I would be there and I would hold their hand because this is what governors do. They care about people. Now, when I'm governor of Texas, we're going to have something called compassionate com com conservatism. And under compassionate conservatism, if your wife leaves you, if your dog leaves you, if you're childish, we in government are still going to care about it. <laughs> I like being American. Americans are different. Americans are cool. And uh, I think, you know, Americans want a president who doesn't have a birth certificate like everyone else. They want a president who doesn't have to declare war every four years as to show that he's cool. Now, one thing I've been alert to president, that's actually easier for validation uh, to, get a, to get a handgun that is a six-pack. So I'm going to have a new executive order that from now on, if you want to buy a handgun, you're going to have to buy it with a six-pack. And I'm also going to have a new health plan, Obamacare. Uh, and in Obamacare, uh, if you feel a cough coming on, this is what I'd like you to do. <laughs> that's my plan. We're going to have a lot of heavy hitters in our my administration, not like Secretary Clinton. And it's going to be a beautiful thing. It's going to be a wonderful thing. We're going to create more jobs than ever before in the history of the world. In fact, every one of you is going to have three or four more jobs to do. You know, we've got a lot of bad Obris coming over from Mexico. Gangs everywhere, criminals everywhere. <laughs> and I'm going to build this big wall between the United States and Mexico. And we're going to charge teenagers to play handball on it. And we're going to play hardball with China. We're not going to import any more of their panda bears before they agree to pay top price for American strawberries.
Well, maybe that's what we can do. But uh, any, any comments or questions about uh, how these 19th century presidents were at least kind of more frugal and uh, had some symbolic virtues that were helpful? <laughs>